Hi, I'm Chashang Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. Over the past few days, we at Three Things have been doing episodes on the assembly elections. On Wednesday, we did a full episode on Uttarakhand. We also have an ongoing series specifically on Uttar Pradesh, the next episode for which comes out tomorrow. That is on the 12th of February. But today, we will be talking about Goa, India's smallest state by size that goes to polls on Monday with the BJP as the incumbent party. Now, to most people who don't live in the state, Goa is a place for vacationing. What comes to mind are beaches, coconut trees, Fenny, the local liquor, and a slow and easy life. This is what the state means to most tourists. But its politics is not something that most outsiders really think about. Even though its politics is fairly unique. For example, it is perhaps the only state where the environment is a major election issue. And at a time when religious tensions are rising across the country, that doesn't seem to have happened in Goa. And this time around, a lot of new things are happening in the lead-up to the polls. Things that have never happened in Goa before. In this episode, we will talk about these things along with what is concerning the voters in the state and what challenges the political parties are facing this time. And for this, joining us is Mayura Janbalkar, who reports on Goa for the Indian Express. Mayura, there are a lot of things that are new to the Goa elections this time. But before we talk about those things, what would you say is the thing that has defined Goan elections in the past? So, you know, to understand Goa's politics, one thing that you have to also understand is the history of the state. Unlike the rest of India, Goa's colonial past is very different. It was under Portuguese rule for 451 years and uh, it was liberated on December 19, 1961. So it was under Portuguese rule until then. And then in liberated Goa, the first election took place in 1963. And Goa was a union territory when it was liberated. And it got its statehood only in 1989. So elections were different before and after statehood because constituencies were different. And the first party that uh, ruled Goa was the indigenous uh, Maharashtravadi Gomantak Party, founded by Dayanand Bandurkar, who is one of the founding fathers of the state and the first chief minister of Goa. Okay, so then from this moment till about the 1970s, we know that it was this party, the Maharashtravadi Gomantak Party, the MGP basically, that was in power in Goa. And it was only after that that we saw the era of Congress in the state in the 1980s. How has politics changed since then? So since then, politics of Goa has been characterized by precarious coalitions, which happened more in the 90s than in the 80s. So there have been governments, there have been assemblies where no one party has got the full majority and people have stitched together governments taking support from MLAs from other parties, independents, people switching over parties to form the government. And that's the history of defections, which is quite long in Goa, at least about two decades old. And so that is why, in a way, you can say that these defections and these precarious coalitions have characterized the politics of the state. Okay, so these defections, like you mentioned, have happened in the state for many years now. But there was also this big case of defection that happened uh, just some years ago that people in the state still have in their minds. Could you talk about what that incident was? So in 2017, the BJP, that is the ruling party, had 13 out of 40 MLAs and Congress had 17. So the Congress obviously had one more number of seats, but the BJP outmaneuvered the Congress into forming a government. It got support from two regional parties, the Maharashtravadi Gomantak Party and the Goa Forward Party, and both of them had three MLAs each and the support of two more independents. And that's how it outsmarted the Congress formed the government and Manohar Parikar was chief minister. Right. And this was actually the third time that he was becoming the chief minister of the state, right? Right. So this happened soon after the election in 2017. But after the death of Manohar Parikar in, in March 2019, Pramod Savan took over as chief minister. 
And when he formed the government, the earlier allies, which were both Maharashtravadi Gomantak Party and Goa Forward Party, supported his government in his protest. But months later, in July of 2019, there was a major political event. And even for a state with a history of defections, this was in many ways unprecedented because of the 15 MLAs that the Congress had and uh, three MLAs that the Maharashtravadi Gomantak Party had, two thirds. So 10 out of 15 Congress MLAs and two out of three MGP MLAs defected to the BJP, calling it a merger of the legislative parties. Wait, merger of the legislative parties? Right. So what happened then was the BJP, which in 2017 had won 13 seats. Now with 12 MLAs switching over, and of course, some independents who had already uh, supported the BJP, the strength of the BJP rose to 27 plus one independent in the assembly. After that, the BJP discarded the leaders of uh, MGP and Goa Forward Party, who were its alliances in the coalition government, and formed a full majority government. So these defections of These 12 MLAs were obviously contested by the two political parties, which is Congress and the MGP. And they filed disqualification petitions against these MLAs who defected. And now these petitions are in the High Court. But whatever the High Court decides will obviously not have a bearing on this election because the term of this assembly is coming to an end. But whatever the High Court decides will definitely have a bearing on defections in the future, not just in Goa, but everywhere in the country. Okay, so right now, because the matter is still pending in court, we don't know whether what happened in 2019 was legal or not. We don't know whether the 10 Congress MLAs switching over to the other side and becoming BJP MLAs is actually allowed by law or not. But the Congress, of course, came under a lot of criticism after it. And now ahead of these elections, the party is actually taking these pledges, right? So that people trust them again. Could you talk about that a bit? So this is something that is happening in Goa for the first time because ever since what happened in 2019, the defections that took place, the Congress has been trying to redeem itself because the criticism was that the Congress just could not keep its flock together. And what is the point of voting for a Congress candidate if he is going to get up and walk into the BJP once he's elected? Plus parties like Amadmi Party and uh, TMC that are also contesting election in Goa this time have attacked the Congress repeatedly, telling voters that it's pointless to vote for the Congress because their candidate is eventually going to go to the BJP. So this is a perception that the Congress had to fight and Congress had to build trust once again. So this was, of course, you know, going a step further and going to a temple, going to a church, going to a darga. And with God as witness, they took a pledge that if they are elected, they will not defect to another party. And the five-year term that they have as an MLA, they will serve it in the Congress. That is what the pledge said. Yeah, and besides going to these places of worship, the Congress leaders in the state in the presence of Rahul Gandhi have also signed affidavits about it. But, you know, pledging in a temple or a church almost seems like someone saying, oh, you know, God promise I won't do this, you know. Kind of like how children say it? Yeah, but that's exactly how it was. They did go from a temple to a church and um, they were administered this presence of a priest. They also went to a darga. And this is also something that the Congress party in Goa wanted the people to see its election candidates doing. Apart from that, the Congress has also said that of its uh, 37 candidates, 31 are fresh young faces and only six are former MLAs. So Congress has done a bit of a rejig in screening its candidates, its procedures, each one recommended by the block committees of the Congress in each constituency. So that is what the Congress is trying to push, that it can be trusted, that it has fresh faces this time. And whatever happens, as is mentioned in an assigned affidavit now, their MLAs will not defect if they are elected. Okay, so this is the challenge that the Congress faces. But now let's talk about the BJP, which is the incumbent and has been in power in the state for the past 10 years. You had mentioned earlier that after the last election, Manohar Parikar became the chief minister and after his death, Pramod Savant took his post. 
what kind of challenges does the party face right now so manohar parikar is often credited with being the man who laid the foundation for the rise of the bjp in goa so he is the tallest bjp leader from goa and in his absence there is a lot that the bjp has had to rework in terms of its campaign its candidate selection and as is the case it has been in power for 10 years in goa so anti incumbency is obviously a concern but this time the bjp in a way had a problem of plenty when it came to distribution of election tickets to candidates selecting its candidates now again like i said 2019 defections weigh on this election because of the situation that the bjp also finds itself in now it had taken mlas from congress and the mgp and you have to remember that these candidates had defeated bjp candidates in 2017 but they were in the bjp now so the bjp had to choose between you know sitting mlas who came to the party from another party and its traditional candidates in uh, different constituencies which was not going to be easy by when it was going to give out election tickets to candidates so as it happened it retained a lot of the sitting mlas who defected to the party but it also left out four or five of them that it could not accommodate this time in its candidate list right and because of this we understand some leaders in the state who would have contested for the bjp are now contesting independently so this is one issue but what other issues does the party face considering that a lot has happened this year so apart from that of course government has also come under criticism for its covid management and this government i mean other government after manohar parikar has also seen you know citizens protest against the three linear projects in 2020 and natural disasters that followed the last one year has been quite eventful for this government and it has been put to test with covid with natural disasters with floods and with very heavy rainfall heaviest since 1983 so a lot of things that the voters would want to measure this government's performance on yeah and covid was particularly bad right during the second wave there was a major oxygen shortage uh, in the state and there was also this major incident uh, where over 80 people had died due to the lack of oxygen supply and that incident had made national headlines So yes there was a situation of oxygen shortage in Goa Medical College that is run by the state government and this happened in May but what happened was the health minister of Goa was the one who said that there seems to be an interruption in oxygen supply between 2 am and 6 am in uh, the covid wards of GMC and he said that the high court should probably order a probe into this statement like that coming from the health minister himself was uh, serious and that's when this matter came to light high court also stepped in and the government did come under a lot of criticism but of course later the dean of the goa medical college and the health minister also said that these deaths of covid-19 patients were uh, cannot be linked to the shortage of oxygen uh, per se I mean these were critical patients their health had already deteriorated so it could be those multiple factors and not just oxygen shortage alone that could have resulted in their deaths this is the stand of the government and there was also an inquiry that the government had instituted into this and that there was a three member committee that uh, came out with a report the committee also did not really fix the responsibility of oxygen supply on any one person in the government but yeah it said that the gmc could have raised an alarm sooner so that this could have been addressed but subsequently the government has maintained that it handled the pandemic very well and not just the state government here even the central leadership has commended pramod sawant and his government for its handling of covid in the state okay so we have talked about the congress party which is trying to convince people that its leaders won't defect later and we have talked about the bjp which is the incumbent and is dealing with the loss of some major leaders uh, anti incumbency and it's covid handling but the two other major parties that are contesting these elections are the aam aadmi party and the trinamool congress so let's talk about aap first this is the second time around that it is campaigning in the state how is it managing to connect with the voters this time right so see aap contested assembly elections in goa for the first time in 2017 it had very active very loud campaign in 2017 as well but 
it drew a blank in the elections it didn't win a single seat but ever since it lost that election completely in 2017 it has had 5 years to create a base for itself in goa and the party also contested uh, local body elections in the state they won a zila panchayat seat in south goa and throughout the pandemic their volunteers were also working on the ground distributing rations and reaching out to people so they had that visibility this time as opposed to 2017 so they've spent 5 years putting their organization in order in the state so this time they uh, seem to be better prepared more clued in about goa or the people of goa or what the voters of goa need this time what the aap has done also is different not just for the party but for the politics of goa is because they have announced a chief ministerial candidate from the bhandari community this is something that arvind kejriwal promised the voters of goa they are a numerically strong community among goa's obcs and are believed to be the largest community in the hindus of goa abhi tak गोवा में एक बहुत बड़ा समाज का हिस्सा है भंडारी समाज उनके मन में इनजस्टिस की फीलिंग है डीपली हर्ट डीप हर्ट की फीलिंग है हमने कहा था कि हम भंडारी समाज से सीएम चेहरा देंगे तो कुछ लोगों ने हमारे ऊपर आरोप लगाया कि जाति की राजनीति कर रहे हैं नहीं हम जाति की राजनीति नहीं कर रहे हैं उन पार्टियों ने जो आज तक जाति की राजनीति की थी हम उसको खत्म कर रहे हैं उस अन्याय की फीलिंग को खत्म कर रहे हैं ओके सो वाइल डूइंग दिस केजरीवाल सेड दैट दिस इज नॉट कास्ट पॉलिटिक्स बट इट अपीयर्स दैट वे एंड दिस इज न्यू फॉर गोवा बिकॉज यू नो इन अदर स्टेट्स वी कॉन्स्टेंटली सी पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज पोलराइजिंग पीपल एंड इवन वोटर्स वोटिंग अलॉन्ग रिलीजियस एंड कास्ट लाइन्स बट दिस डजेंट रियली हैपन दैट मच इन गोवा राइट right this is something that is happening for the first time where a political party has showcased a chief ministerial candidate from a particular community that is the bhandari community and although arvind kejriwal says this is not playing caste politics he is coming in for criticism for exactly that i mean not just the opposition parties saying that you shouldn't resort to caste politics in goa because it's not going to work but this is also something that the people have felt political observers feel that this doesn't cut it with the voters in goa not to say that votes are not cast on the lines of religion but election campaigns or speeches are never about religion or caste at least so far in goa this is what most political observers will tell you and does that have anything to do with the demographics of the region because even when it comes to religious tensions we haven't seen so much of that in goa right There aren't. See, about sixty-six percent of the population in Goa is Hindu, and about twenty-six percent is Christian, and the rest of it is Muslims and other religions. But Goa doesn't have a history of serious communal tension, and this is a part of Goa's unique identity, where there are churches and temples, and within the same premises, people follow different uh, religions. And this is also the unique identity that the people of Goa say that they have, and they also try to fiercely protect. so when a party is like congress or almost every party that is contesting election promises to protect goa's unique culture goa's unique heritage goa's unique identity because this is something that really matters to the electorate okay so we have mentioned two new things so far one new thing is politicians taking pledges and second is this caste politics being played out by aam aadmi chief arvind kejriwal But the third new thing is the fact that the Trinamool Congress is contesting in Goa for the first time. This has been talked about a lot after its major win in West Bengal Assembly elections last year. The party is looking to test waters in other places, Goa being one of them. What does its campaign look like? So TMC has been in Goa for the last four and a half months. They arrived towards the end of September in 2021, and they arrived with a bang. So. 
So TMC arrived with the strength and resources of Prashant Kishore's IPAC. So they have been on this media blitzkrieg since their arrival. And then all over Goa, you could see hundreds of hoardings of Mamta Banerjee. They were on the airwaves, on the radio, in newspaper ads, social media. The TMC announced its arrival very, very boisterously. But in the following months, you know, you saw people taking interest, at least people being curious, because what the TMC was offering was an alternative saying that the state has been locked between the BJP and the Congress, which it said was the two parties were one and the same. Because again, talking about the defections of 2019, saying that, you know, if you vote for the Congress, it's the same as voting for the BJP because that's where their MLEs will go. So initially, you know, when Mamta Banerjee made her first trip to Goa, There was a lot of interest. But in the months that followed, I mean, things may not have played out the way TMC expected them to. And when the TMC first came, of course, they said that they were not going to ally with any other party. But in the subsequent months, they formed a pre-poll alliance with the Maharashtravadi Gumantak Party, which was formerly an ally of the BJP. And uh, in January, TMC put its hand forward and said that let all the opposition parties, Congress, Amadmi Party, go forward. Let's everybody come together to fight the BJP. But uh, parties like the Congress and uh, AAP uh, didn't seem very enthused about this idea. So that didn't go any further from there. Right. And Mayura, the other thing I was wondering was that both the TMC and the Amadmi Party probably also have to battle the image of the outsider, right? Because this is something that Goans don't like, outsiders coming in and dictating what they should do. Absolutely. I mean, this is a perception that both the AAP and the TMC have to fight. Now, this is what also the BJP is saying about these two parties, not just the BJP, even the Congress is. So this is the perception of the outside party, something that both the AAP and the TMC are fighting. They're doing it through social media campaigns, through their ads, trying to assert that they're not parties from outside and they want to promote local leaders. And both BJP and the Congress are also headquartered in Delhi. So they can't be making these allegations of outside parties sort of invading into a state where they've never had a presence. And you know, the other thing I was thinking was whether the TMC thinks that just because Goa is a small state, it'll be easier to win votes there. Uh, But do you think that's something that can go against the party? You know, thinking that Goa is small, it's easy. So let us try our hand there. Right. See, I mean, there is nothing wrong in trying to contest an election in a state where you haven't contested before. Our democracy allows that. But to think that because Goa is a small state and about 1,600 odd polling booths in the state, that alone is not going to determine what happens in this election. Because to understand how politics functions in the state, what people prioritize, how protective they are of their unique Cohen identity, and also what you need to do to win over voters. So uh, the one thing that probably did not sit well with the voters was that the TMC arrived only four months before election in Goa and it didn't really have any work to show the people in Goa because this is the first time that the party was contesting elections in the state. So it was riding basically on its achievements in West Bengal. But people may be impressed by Mamta Banerjee's victory in West Bengal. They may also be impressed by Moa Moita, who is the state in charge here and her speeches in parliament. But will that translate into votes for the TMC? I mean, that is something that we'll have to wait and see. Because even if these leaders are here in Goa, they're present here, uh, but these are not the people who are going to be Emily's in Goa. So that message, you will have to wait and see if it has percolated to the voter. Okay, so now talking about the concerns of the voters, one thing that seems to be unique about Goan politics is that this is perhaps one of the few or even the only state where environment is a major election issue. Could you talk about that aspect a bit and why that is the case? So environment is also something that is very, very close to the heart of the people here in Goa. And at the center of a very large protest by citizens of Goa, students, professionals, everybody, were these three linear projects that the BJP government at the center is executing in Goa. Now, that is the double tracking of the railway line from Castle Rock in Karnataka to Kule in South Goa. Then there is the expansion of a national highway and there is a power project, the Tamnar, which will require the cutting of 
a lot of trees in the Molam National Park and in the Bhagwan Mahavir Sanctuary. Now, this is something that really snowballed in November, December 2020. And people uh, started the Save Mole movement here in Goa. And it has, you know, constantly been met with opposition from citizens, from uh, environmentalists who have said that these projects are not going to benefit anyone in Goa. But they are just going to make Goa a coal hub and all these three projects be aimed at no one in Goa, but to for the benefit of maybe some industrialists. So these projects have always been at the center of a debate and Congress, TMC have uh, said in their manifestos that they will scrap these projects. Now the BJP government uh, that is executing these projects is obviously standing by them and saying that our visionary projects and they will secure the future of Goa and they will bring about development in the state. But, you know, while each party is making its manifesto announcing it, the citizens of Goa and those associated with the Save Mole campaign have made their own green manifesto. And they want their election candidates to see the green manifesto. And if they expect candidates to have a plan for protecting the environment of Goa. Now, that is, these three linear projects is one thing, but also mining is another issue, which is a very important issue for Goa because a lot of livelihoods depend on mining until it was active here. And almost for a decade now, mining activities have come to a stall here in Goa and they need to be revived, so many livelihoods. But even when you bring back mining, it has to be brought back in a sustainable manner, in a manner that is not to the detriment of the environment. Now, this is something that citizens want. Citizens have demanded that mining should be sustainable and it needs to be resumed as fast as possible, but it has to be sustainable. Right. And talking about mining, I believe it is also an important source of revenue for the state, right? Because apart from that, the other major thing is tourism, which also has been hit by COVID. Absolutely. See, this is a tourism state. This is a popular international tourist destination, Goa. It has been for decades now. So when the pandemic struck uh, at the start of 2020, obviously it hit uh, tourism like it did in most parts of the world. But this really hurt the economy here because there is tourism and allied professions that depend on tourism. So that took a major hit. And also to mention that unemployment is one of the major poll issues this time. Goa has among the highest rates of unemployment in the country and reviving mining, giving a boost to tourism. These things were required for generating jobs. So all these three issues that are linked with uh, the election are issues that people are expecting answers from electoral candidates, from parties and feature in party manifestos. Okay, so we have talked about how different parties have been campaigning, the challenges they face, the concerns that people have. But since we know about Goa's history of defections and the way coalitions are formed, I guess a lot will depend on what happens after the polls, right? So traditionally, it has always been interesting. And again, this is something that uh, people who have followed Goa politics for a long time will tell you that everything will be put to test after the election results. Because like I said, in 2017 also, the party that had the most number of MLAs did not form the government. So, you know, there is nothing obvious about how governments are formed in Goa. Anything can happen. And it's all about who outsmarts the other. It's quite likely that there might be a fractured mandate. But um, I mean, these are just uh, speculations at this stage that the best they can be. But of course, after election, it will be very interesting because even parties like AAP have said if there is a need, they may enter a post-poll alliance with a non-BJP party, you know, while they've been writing the TMC off. And the TMC also has at least one very good candidate who has had a history of winning elections. So it's not that TMC is not a contender, it is. It remains to be seen now how the government is formed in the event of a fractured mandate and it will definitely throw up some new, you know, political calculations, equations, which uh, will be interesting to watch after March 10th. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at IndianExpress.com. 